Welcome. It is so wonderful to be here. You are present at Life's Invisible Feast. And believe it or not, Life's Invisible Feast is here all the time, but we don't realize it. It has everything to do with time, but not time the way we think about time, not time in past and future, not time in so fast and not enough time and too slow, but right here in the moment. That's what I call real time. And that's where Life's Invisible Feast resides. I first started to get a sense of this when I was a young girl living in England. And every time I would sit down to write, I put pen to paper, and it's as though time expanded almost exponentially. I was right there with the paper and the pen, and things came out of that pen that I didn't even know that I knew. It was an amazing experience. And I had the sense that at some point in my life, I would be a writer, but I didn't know how it would happen. I just knew that I loved to write. So a few years later, in my early teens, my family moved to Los Angeles from this little village in England, which was quite a culture shock. Um, but here I was, still wanting to be a writer, but my parents thought, maybe we better for me to wait until I had something to write about. And so they encouraged me to pursue another of my passions, which was architecture. I was excited about that too. And so fast forward a few years, and I'm now the, the managing partner of a residential architecture firm of 45 people. This is the mid-90s. And we have figured out how to help people make houses that are better rather than bigger. Instead of trying to knock the socks off the neighbor, why not make the house so that it fits you to a T? So now I knew I had something I wanted to write about. But I was living a way, way, way too busy life to even think about writing. So I sort of chucked that out in the corner somewhere and thought, that's the back burner, that's for another day. Every night I would come home and I'd be reading just to sort of change the subject from my too busy, busy day so that I could go to sleep to wake up and do it again. And I suddenly realized, it was almost like having, it was one of those epiphanies where you just go, oh my goodness, if I don't make a change in my life, I am never, ever going to have time to write. Because what's ever going to change? I'm always too busy, I've always packed it to the gills, and I never have time to really sit and pay attention to what my heart longs to do. And so right then and there, I knew I had to make that commitment. It wasn't, there was no equivocality about it. This I had to do. So the next day I went to work and I did the only thing I could do to make time. I gave myself a new project number, I became my own new client, and I penciled myself in on Tuesday and Thursday mornings into my calendar. Now I can say that now and it sounds simple enough, but it was actually one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I had all these projections about my clients and my partners wanting to fire me. You know, I just assumed that the world would come crumbling down, but I could not not do it. None of those projections happened. I was supported in the most amazing ways. I was brought the publisher, an agent. I didn't have to do anything than other, other than just take that first step to start weaving this into my own life. I was still an architect, but I got to write as well. It was a wonderful thing. And fast forward to the end of my uh, having published the, the book, and suddenly a few months later, I'm on Oprah, I'm on a Charlie Rose, I'm on Diane Rehm, and many, many other media outlets. Something amazing had happened, and I had no idea how. But in hindsight, I can see what occurred. All I had done was followed what my heart longed to do. I wasn't interested in being famous. That was the last thing from on my mind. What I wanted to do was help people of average means to make better houses and to use their money effectively. And all these different people that have your ear in the media were able to help their viewers and their listeners understand how to do that for themselves by having me talk about it. Just incredible. When you really, really are passionate about something, the doors open. So after, obviously my life changed pretty dramatically right then, and I became more of a public speaker. Architecture took a bit more of a background uh, role in my life, for a little while anyway. And I began to think about another book that I wanted to write. 
I wanted to talk about the architecture of our lives. How is it that we can find the meaningfulness that I now knew how to find by pursuing your passion? I wanted to encourage others to look at their own lives and see what's in the way of living that passion. And so, I, again, I started talking to publishers, but many of them were saying to me, you're an architect, what do you know about how to live your life? You know, stay with architecture. But I focused on what I wanted to say. I didn't listen to the negative comments, I just focused on, I know I have something to say, I want to say this and I want to say it clearly. And again, doors opened. So this is one of the tools to find life's feast. When you follow your heart and you do what you really want to do, and you focus on what you long for, rather than all the things that say you can't do it, everything shifts. So this is why we're told to follow our passion, or as Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss. It's because in that bliss, you are more likely to be present in what you're doing. So it's actually, paradoxically enough, not the passion that matters. It's a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong. But if you're one of those people, and I know there are those of you in this audience that say, I never have known what my passion is, don't worry about it. Just learn how to become present in your life. You can be cleaning bathrooms for a living, but if you're there and completely engaged, you are at life's banquet table. It's that simple. But why is it that we don't do this uh, staying present in our, our lives? We have all these filters over reality that stop us from being able to see what's here. Our minds think they're running the show, and so we have all these thoughts about what we're supposed to do in the future or what we just did in the past, and that takes up 99.9% .9 of the space in our lives and the time in our lives. So we have to start looking at what are the conditioned patterns, or actually neurotic patterns, but uh, we prefer to think of them as conditions since we don't like to think of ourselves as neurotic, but every human being has these. What are the conditioned patterns that keep us from experiencing what's here right now? I want to give you an analogy to help you imagine how this might be, these filters that get in the way. If you look through a kaleidoscope, at the end of that kaleidoscope are all those little pieces of glass and colored plastic, and they are filtering what you see, and they create a pattern. But beyond that kaleidoscope, there's a light source, and there's a reality beyond. What I'm trying to help people see with the books I've written is to look through the conditioned patterns. You can't make them go away, but you can notice that they're there and then see through to the light source on the other side. That's where reality is. That's where life's feast is. So as you learn to see your patterns, you can begin to look through them. So for example, for me, I'm still often too busy. But when I watch that pattern start to assert itself, I'll meditate for a couple minutes or go for a walk, change the subject, and recognize that that pattern is not who I am. It's just something that thinks it can run my life. So then I can step back from it, have a little space from it, and keep going, but at a much more reasonable pace. Sounds simple, it takes a lot of work. But that's a key to finding life's feast. There's another story that I want to tell you about how to find this presence in our lives. If you're looking for a marker in your own life for presence, sometimes it's a good thing to look at something that's happened in nature, because we've all had those moments where there's a real profundity. We are encouraged to be present, but what does it really mean? So I want to give you a marker in your own life. Perhaps you watched an amazing sunset, and it took your breath away. Or perhaps you were out on a boat in the middle of a moonless night, and you look up at the stars, and suddenly there's just the black perforated by a million dots of white, and there's you and the boat, and the water, and the stars, and the darkness. And you're all one in that moment. That's presence. In my own life, <coughs> excuse me, in my own life, I experienced that really profoundly when I was a teenager. And I was running across the crest of a hill, and suddenly, there in front of me were 50 deer, all looking directly at me. 
So eyes were meeting eyes. I stopped dead in my tracks, but there was no fear. It was just that moment of complete absorption in that moment. That was presence. So we all have just little bits of that. If you don't think of one right now, again, don't worry about it. They'll come to you, you'll remember. We actually can live our entire lives in that present moment. So the final story I want to tell you about is another way to see how this presence can work in our lives. There is a shift in looking at everything that happens in our lives that will change everything for you. If you start to recognize that everything that happens is a reflection of something about you, and it's in your life to feed you, when you're having a reaction to someone or there's life events that you're not happy with, instead of feeling that those things shouldn't be happening, I want you to start to ask, what is this in my life to teach me? The story is a Sufi teaching story about this very thing, and it's called the Hall of Mirrors. In the Hall of Mirrors, there's a dog. He's the only creature in the room, and the room has mirror on every surface. It's multifaceted, so around him are dozens and dozens of dogs. As he looks to the side, he sees a glint in one of those dogs' eyes. He doesn't know it's himself, and he thinks, I don't trust that guy. <laughs> so he starts to prowl, and as he prowls, of course, the dog's coming right towards him, very aggressive. And then he starts to bark, and as he barks, all the dogs are barking. And then he runs, and he runs, and he starts fighting with all the images. He does this for hours, and he finally falls dead in the middle of the room, and all the mirrors go silent. Now, obviously, it's a very sad story, but I want you to recognize that that dog is you. Our whole lives we spend fighting with all of those images, not realizing that they're here to show us to us. So turn everything that's happening around and ask, what is this in my life to show me? That's where life's invisible feast is. And when you come to understand that everything here is a playground for your own growth, you start to be at the banquet just as we are today with all these incredible people sharing their passions. And we begin to live life the way it's supposed to be lived. Thank you so much.